Thank you. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you so much for your prayers. We felt those. They, you can't believe how God intervene, intervened in our lives in the last few weeks. And someday I'd love to tell that story to you. But thank you. This morning, I wanted to let you know we're going to be, uh, we have a videographer that's going to be here today and is going to be videoing throughout the service and be walking around. If you see that, that, don't get distracted by that. And this is for our new website that we're working on so we can have some live video of our uh, services. If you do not want to be in this video, after the service, if you'll come by our Welcome Center and let us know, uh, you know, uh, so we can and know where you're sitting, we can make sure that's edited out of that. But otherwise, you will be in there, okay? So uh, just want you to be aware of that. Well, today was our Children's Ministry Promotion Day in our life groups, and they began meeting this morning at 9 back on campus. We were so glad to have our children back on campus today. They had a great kickoff last Wednesday night, about 30 kids here Wednesday night and about 30 this morning, and that has been tremendous. So we've had a great start getting our children back on campus. Now we're working to try to get everybody on campus. Next Sunday is National Back to Church Sunday. You've seen the logo in the bulletin there, Stronger Together, and I'll say another phrase, Safe Together. We're we, we need each other. We need to be together, pass that word, and I guarantee you it's safe here. Amen? I guarantee you it's safer here than at Walmart. It's safer here than at Publix. It's a safe place to be. So God bless you for being here. Get that word out. I'll tell you, we can come here just for a, a little bit every week to be together and to worship together and hear God's word together. So I hope you will do that. And thank you for those that are joining us via uh, the internet and uh, we're grateful for that also. Now also uh, then on Saturday, September the 26th is National and Global Day of Prayer the, the return and from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on that day in here will be a simulcast going on. Some of the top Christian leaders in America will be leading in prayer it'll be a live event but we're simulcasting it and you're welcome to come anytime from 9 to 9 on Saturday, September the 26th to join in. There are some people committed. To, they said they're going to be here the whole day, and some are going to commit long periods of time, but I would encourage you to commit sometime. Maybe if just an hour would be great. Folks, we need to pray for our nation. So I hope that you would consider that and come and join us on September the 26th and pray for our nation. Then, folks, Operation uh, Christmas Child is, is getting that season now. And we need our efforts to be doubled this year because so many churches, there's so many churches not even meeting yet. And they're expecting the uh, contributions to be way down this year. And folks, there's never been a greater need worldwide than for this Operation Christmas Child, another opportunity to touch children around the world. So I hope you'll prayerfully consider participating in that. It's a great project for a class, it's a great project for a family. It's a great project for a, maybe just a, a just group of people you want to get together and do that together. 
and we'll have more information in the foyer uh, probably starting next week to tell you more about that but just wanted you to get that on your radar because the deadline for that will be Sunday November the 22nd well if you're visiting with us today you're our special guest and we're so glad you joined us there's a card uh, in the pew in front of you like this we'd like to ask if you would to fill that out and then as you exit today as you go out the uh, exit doors there'll be uh, ushers there with the offering plate and you can just drop that in the offering plate we'd love to have a record of your visit well again it's been a special day today as we kind of started back our promotion day and as we always do on promotion Sunday we recognize our first graders they went from kindergarten to the first grade and one of the great things we like to do is put a Bible in their hands so I'm going to turn it over to our uh, family's pastor uh, brother Scott thank you Fred good morning so we love kids at Mount Dora. We have kids in the service this morning. No Children's Church today. We're working on getting that back. We love kids. Mark Twain said he loved kids, but he suggested this with children, that at age 10 they'd be put in a barrel and fed through a hole. And at age 15 the hole be plugged up. But we're going to do our best to raise children in a way they should go so when they're older they will not depart from it. And uh, I have uh, a couple of special friends today I want to introduce you to. And that's Aiden. Come on down. Aiden is way up there in the cheap, cheap seats. Come on, buddy. He's way up there. We're going to come this way, Aiden. And Declan. Where's my friend Declan? Declan is here. So, Declan, come here. Come here. We got something for Declan. And uh, I want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Are there any uh, of our friends? Over this way for me, buddy. Any of our friends uh, for, that had gone from kindergarten to first grade today? Did I miss anybody? Got a list, and I don't think I see you on the list if, you, if you're here. I missed you. Anybody else? Okay, cool. Come on, Aiden. Come on. So these, uh, these young men are moving from first grade, or kindergarten to first grade. Come right here. We've got a Bible for you, too. Hang on one second. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. We'll get a picture with Pastor and Aiden in the Bible. All right. We got it. Declan, right there. All right. Aiden. Stay right here. Wait, Declan. It's okay. Thank you. <laughs> We're very, very happy for you. Very proud. Okay. All right. I hope work goes well this week. Tell the family we said hi and drive carefully. And you know what? When we hide that word in our heart, something incredible happens. We grow in it every day. Give me a fist bump. Fist bump. All right. We'll see you. Now, get out of here. We love kids, always fun times. Church, would you stand with me as we sing this morning? Here we go. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind? was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious name You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the Glorious 
addiction, strongholds, and every disease. They have no power over me. Over me. Recession, depression, and over.
When my final breath is left this lost, I'll forever be with you. Where my song goes on and on. I will lift my hands up. I will raise my voice up. I will shout a good love till the day that I die. Everything that I have, all my worship I bring. You're the reason I live. You're the reason. Pray with me, please. God, Jesus, you are the reason God, that we live. You give us breath each day. God, you're the reason we sing. You're the reason we're here today. We're here to worship you, Jesus. And God, I, I just love this message that we've been singing this morning. Jesus, you're the reason that addiction, depression, anxiety, disease and affliction has no power over us Jesus I was broken you are my healing now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future my eyes are open because when you called my name I ran out of that grave Jesus thank you for coming and dying on a cross to pay the penalty for my sin thank you that you rose again on that third day and that you share that victory over sin, over death with us. That you are coming again, and we will rise to be with you. Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, we know you are here. You are helping us worship. Speak through pastors. He gives your word. Father, continue to move in our service. Jesus, to you be the glory. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Welcome home. Welcome home, everyone. I'm so glad to see you today. Know that we are touching the world for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are also touching our community. Uh, this week, Mark Willoughby and uh, Dale Tibbetts and your first lady, my wife Sherry, got together, and they began packing bag after bag of new clothing for the schools. You are very familiar with Mission Mount Dora and for years how we've provided for families. But the school system, as well as our members, realized to bring uh, 700 people through our building with 150 volunteers. Now is just not the time to do that in, and have that close of proximity with everyone. So we are uh, just taking Mission Mount Dora to the schools. In fact, it's really more like Love Lake County to, to the schools. And so we're doing 30 pair of new socks, 30 underwear, 30 pair of jeans, 30 shirts, and new shoes. And so this week, Sherry and Josh began meeting with the social workers and principals at Mount Dora Middle School, and then uh, Tavares Elementary, and Seminole Springs Elementary, and then this week they will be meeting uh, with Triangle Elementary and other schools, Eustis Elementary. It's going throughout the whole community as we minister to the least of these, the children in these schools. One school has already called Sherry and said, you need to know we've clothed a student today with what you brought with us, uh, brought for us. So, of course, this way it is different. We don't get to have the opportunity to share the gospel with each one of the families, but we still are ministering in Jesus' name. And you know, on top of that, you've already noticed, if you look at the back of the bulletin, we're ministering in Jesus' name in our community in a special way. And we're, again, not able to share the gospel presentation with each family. But you know what I've discovered? 
Jesus fed people even when they didn't believe in him. I don't know if you realize that or not, but you look at the scriptures, Jesus would take care of people even when they had no thought of him. And so here's what we're doing. We're feeding this community, and this coming Saturday at 10 a.m., we're going to do it again, just six days from now. The Florida Baptist Convention has provided us another refrigerated truck and we're going to feed our community this coming Saturday. And all the schools are putting this on their websites for the neediest families. But here's what I want you to realize. Even if you're not going to volunteer, or if you need anything, you've certainly come in through the line this coming Saturday. But I will say this. Even if you're not going to volunteer and you don't need anything and you won't come through the line, here's what I would ask of you. Next Saturday morning, would you consider between 10 and 10.30, maybe even 10.45, just drive by this corner and see what God is doing. Just drive by. You don't have to get out of your car or anything else. I just want you to see the hundreds and hundreds of families that will line up from the FMC all the way around the property, all the way around the sanctuary, back through this parking lot, back into the back parking lot as they're waiting. And to give you a little clearer picture of that, I want you to see what we did Thursday. If you would, play that video. We want every person to know that Jesus loves them. And so today, here we are serving food. Uh, each box weighs 22 pounds, filled with fresh produce, milk, meat. And so this can make a difference in a family's budget for a week's worth of groceries. And most families are getting at least two boxes. This is a third party truck that Florida Baptist Convention got a hold of. They got this food to us for free. And we we're able to just get it out into the community, reach out. people on Facebook, getting out the community and everybody we've heard from is just very excited. You know, thank you for doing this. Uh, we're excited. Thank you, church, that you guys are providing for us. We just got some extra this time. We took care of a, a lot of people that really needed it. And this time, we didn't ask. We need one or two. We gave them two. So people drive up, they, they, just, they got a big smile on their face. They, they seem to be happy that we're doing this for, the, you know, for, for Jesus Christ. It was great. We're hoping there's going to be more. There should hoping be another for wave. a second wave of them coming through. Free fresh food! Well, that gave you a little picture of this past Thursday, and since most of the youth were in school, we were very fortunate. Several of the college and career showed up, and we were able to uh, truly just bless this community in a wonderful, wonderful way. You saw that. We had more than 50 volunteers and just six days, and we're doing it, doing it all over again. Uh, church, something you need to know we are only paying for the forklift and a few other things. We are not having to pay for the transportation of the food, nor the food. This is all being provided through the Florida Baptist Convention, and it just makes you proud to be a Southern Baptist and see what the convention is doing. And I want you to know this is going uh, throughout the state, literally from Key West all the way to Pensacola. The Florida Baptist Convention is using Southern Baptist churches that are dis that's distributing this food throughout the entire state during this pandemic. And so uh, it's been a, a really powerful thing to see. Well, today, I want to encourage you with another overcomer in the Lord. We've looked at King David three times and Job. We've looked at Peter. And today, we're going to look at Paul. See, all of God's greats, 
go through difficulties and trials. All of God's greats do. So if you really want to be great for God, you just need to know you're going to have difficulties and trials. It's going to come your way. Suffering and testing, pandemics and economic shutdowns, fears and struggles are common to all of God's greats. So this morning, I want you to do this a little different than we've done it before. I want you to find in your Bible three places. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. The readings are brief. I'll begin at the end of the chapter. Acts 7, 57. And then Acts 22. Acts 22. I'll begin in verse 17. And then lastly, Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. General Electric Power Company. The power is Philippians. That's Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, General Electric Power Company. Philippians chapter 3. Okay, now that you've got those three places, and I do too, let me put on my glasses, and then we can go ahead and stand in honor of God's Word. Let's stand in honor of God's Word. Acts chapter 7 beginning in verse 57. This is the stoning of Stephen, if you wonder where we are. It's the stoning of Stephen. And I want to give you an introduction of a man, this is the first time he's mentioned in Scripture, that needed a new beginning. Acts 7, 57, hear the word of the Lord. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him, that Stephen, with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's the first time he's mentioned in the New Testament, right there. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And one of the early church fathers, Augustine, actually said, with that prayer, God began to work on a young man named Saul. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And here is his introduction. How would you like this to be your introduction for all eternity? Now Saul was consenting to his death. What an introduction. There it is. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, here he is again, he made havoc on the church. Do you see that word, havoc? In Greek literature, this, Bible, this, verse is, this word is almost never used, but in Greek literature, this word, havoc, was only used of wild boars and the destruction that they caused. That's how it was used in Greek literature, this word, havoc. And now look at how it describes Saul. And he made havoc on the church, entering every house, tearing them up. That's what wild boars do. And dragging off men and women committing them to prison. He's destroying, tearing up the church of the living God. Now Acts 22, beginning in verse 17. Acts 22, 17. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. That's Jesus speaking. For they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord... They know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. We would call that today an accessory to murder. Okay, he would go to prison for that. Then he said to me, Depart, I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Now, flip over to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. General Electric Power Company, that's where it is, it's the power. 
beginning in verse 12. 312, the book of joy. And here's what Paul says in these verses of Philippians. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, key phrase, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. May God's word not come back void. You may be seated. Paul is perhaps the most educated person in the entire New Testament. And this man who spoke at least four languages and could write in at least three of them, probably all four, had to learn to let go of his past. I want you to hear me well this morning. Many of you in this room, you need to let go of your past. And that was the success of the Apostle Paul. In the power of Christ Jesus, he was able to let go of his past. This overcomer, Paul, stands heads and shoulders above so many. He has the passion of the Apostle Peter. Yet, when he preached people would fall asleep. But don't worry, when they would fall out of the window, the Apostle Paul, because of his relationship with the Lord Jesus, was able to raise them from the dead. Really comforts me to know that people fell asleep in the Apostle Paul's preaching. If you die, I don't know that we'll be able to raise you from the dead, though. I would love to think we're filled with that kind of power. That was Paul. Oh, what an incredible man. He endured so much, and he was truly an overcomer. And I want you to know, if you are to glorify the Lord this side of heaven, all of you must learn to be overcomers by faith and learn to leave the past. You've got to let go of the past. Paul endured so much. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. You're going to feel like a spiritual gymnast today, but Paul wrote almost half of the New Testament. So it's, you, to get the flavor, you have to go and see what he said. And Paul, in chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians, it's Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. If you'll go to Rome, uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, and then I'll be in, ver in chapter 11 in a moment. But 2 Corinthians 6, look at what this man endured, beginning in verse 3. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians. We give no offense in anything. Let's just stop right there. Week after week, most everyone in church, there will be at least one person, week after week, that's offended at church. And here's what they'll do. You know, they didn't speak to me today. Or they'll say something like this. Did you see how they were dressed? Or perhaps like this. It was so cold in there today, my nose was numb. I always want to tell people, then stand up here with me. You'll sweat like crazy. You know... I, to take that one phrase, we give no offense in anything. How many people get upset about something every single week? You know, the music was too loud. I couldn't hear what the preacher had to say. Y'all know hearing's not the same for everybody. Same with temperature. Same with everything. Different strokes for different folks. Some like it loud, some like it hot, some like it cold. It, you know, we're not going to please everybody. That's just the way. But they, listen, the Apostle Paul is so mature, it didn't matter what people were going to say or how they were going to treat him. He takes no offense in anything, and here's why, that our ministry may not be blamed. You know, it's, it's amazing. I've just learned, let it roll like water on a duck's back is the old phrase. Just let it roll. People tell me they're hot. I say, congratulations. They say they're cold. I said, good for you. You, you. you know, it doesn't matter to me. 
I, I just let it go, move on. It, it doesn't matter if it's too loud, too, too, not too loud, uh, well, whatever. Uh, okay, we're glad you're here. Uh, that's my worst. I just don't take offense at any of it. First of all, I know how to push no buttons on this campus. You just need to know that. I don't cut off lights. I don't lock doors. If it's got electricity, I do not touch it. People know this. So, bottom line, regardless of your complaint, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I don't know how to... Do, I can't make it brighter. I can't make it darker. I can't make it colder. I don't know how to do any of that. And you know what? My wife still loves me. So you've got to learn to just love me anyway. <laughs> I've got to confess right here. I took Mr. Ray White, one of my lamps that wasn't working. This tells you my mechanical inclination. The lamp had quit working, and I couldn't make it work. I took it to him and took off the shade, took the whole lamp in my car. He brings it back the same day, and he said, Pastor, I said, yeah. He said, it was the bulb. <laughs> it needed a new bulb. Now, most of you are more mechanical than me. So if it's cold, fix it. That's my response. Fix it. If it's hot, fix it. I don't fix it. I work on one thing, hearts. That's it, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so you just need to know that's where I am. So take no offense in anything that our ministry may not blame, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience. Mr. Ray was so patient with me when he brought back the lamp. He literally had to explain it to me. What do you mean the bulb doesn't work? I tried another bulb. No, 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 Pastor. It had to be a special bulb. Well, I put three bulbs in that thing. It had to be something else. No, it was just the bulb. I felt about as dumb as dirt in that moment. In patience and tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes and imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor, by dishonor, by evil reports, by good reports, as deceivers and yet true. And as unknown and yet well known as dying and behold we live as chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing yet possessing all things oh what a testimony for a man who endured so much and learned to leave the past behind in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 Beginning in verse 22, we learn how much he had to leave behind. How much Paul learned to leave the past alone. In verse 22, we begin reading these words. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. You need to know Jesus only received that once. The cat of nine tails was only on Jesus once. It usually would bring a man to the point of death, and many times they would bleed to death. Paul endured that five times. We don't know when these times happened. They're not recorded in the scriptures. Three times I was beaten with rods. We don't know when these times happened. He would have been so bruised internally, it is amazing that his kidneys ever worked again. Three times. Once I was stoned. I don't even know how you get over that. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. I have no idea how he survived three shipwrecks. Only one is recorded for us in Acts. I want you to know I don't play in the ocean at night. I walk out to the beach on a night, stick my big toe in, and I hear two notes. Da-da. 
and then they repetitively go faster. Da 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 da. -da. I know he's right there. I'm telling you, me at night in the ocean, so uh, mm -mm, something bump up against you, you'd think that was a fish. How big was that fish? How, can you imagine the terror at night on the open sea? I, mm -mm, no. Uh-uh, something touched me, I'm telling you, I would have been hollering bloody murder in that water. I, oh, no, 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 uh-uh, not at night. Can't see what's down there. Whoa, oh, no, 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 Paul endured that. And look, it keeps getting worse. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. You know the Jews wanted to kill him. In perils of the Gentiles, you know the Gentiles wanted to kill him. He'd tell them to stop worshiping their idols and so they'd start a riot. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness besides the other things that come upon me daily my deep concern for all the churches and you say why would you throw in the church with all these beatings and fastings and shipwrecks and the reason is most of you in the room have never been responsible for a church for the people of the church and I want you to know if you're really a good pastor you eat and breathe and sleep for your people you're always you're the last thing on my mind when I go to sleep you're the first thing on my mind when I wake up I think of the church incessantly all the time and that's what Paul was doing he was worried about the church all the time Paul has gone through it never think that because you suffer, especially for Jesus, that somehow it is because of the judgment of the Lord. Now, I know some suffering, some suffering can be judgment. You're, in, uh, you're drinking and, and you hit somebody, you face the consequences from that because of your sin. That's, that you could say that's judgment. But, Saul, but Paul's sufferings and tribulations were because he was faithful. I'll never forget coming home in a body cast as a missionary and literally feeling like a complete failure, utterly worthless for the Lord and his kingdom. What had I done that had caused this situation where I literally felt I could never be used for the Lord Jesus Christ? praying all night and then seeing God answer those prayers months later and you have now heard him preach when Jarrett repented of his sin and came back to the Lord Jesus Christ. When he found me on the floor the next day in my body cast, I couldn't move. He had to pick me up and he's, his one sentence to me after him being in a night of sin was, don't ever do that again. Isn't it funny how sinful people put it back on you? All I've done is pray all night till I can't move, and then he puts it back on me. Don't you ever do that again. Praise the Lord he repented of his sin. On top of all of that, on top of everything else, and all of Paul's suffering, Look at what happens to him in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 7. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, we read these words. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Exalted? Dude, you've been shipwrecked three times. You've been beaten three times. You've had a cat of nine tails rip the flesh off your stomach and your back five times. You should be dead. And he says lest I be exalted a thorn in the flesh was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me lest I be exalted above measure concerning this thing I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me 
and he said to me, you want to leave your past behind? Look what the Lord said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. I've heard many years, through many years, how people have used this phrase, a thorn in the flesh, in their own spiritual lives. People have, with bad marriages, both men and women have told me, she's the thorn in my flesh, or he's the thorn in my flesh. The only question I always ask is, have you prayed for them to be removed? Please be careful about that one. That was supposed to be funny. Y'all are going to wake up in a minute. I do say that to people, though. I, you understand, I don't want them doing that one. People have told me about their drug addictions being the thorn in their flesh. Or people who are alcoholics have told me, this is the thorn in my flesh. I've even had people tell me with their sexual temptations and wrong thoughts like homosexual temptations and other things, and people have said, this is the thorn in my flesh. I guess many things could be the thorn of the flesh. The difference is we must always realize that God does not tempt, nor can he be tempted. God never tempts. So no sinful temptation ever comes from God. But even here, we see that Satan was allowed to buffet Paul. So I guess the Lord even uses Satan to buffet us in many ways, and therefore, I guess, because of that, a temptation from Satan could be a thorn in your flesh. Paul is such an overcomer. He learns to deal with all of these things by the grace of God and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. So I ask you just plain and simple today, and this is the beginning if you were taking notes of where you would say you are today. Do you live for the Lord Jesus Christ? In the good times and in the bad times, do you live for Jesus? Do you live for Jesus when you're going through trials and when you're not? How well are you living for Jesus? Paul lived well for Jesus. Paul is this incredible missionary and theologian. He is literally trained in Greek learning so that he quotes both, both obscure and well-known Greek poets in his writings. He received the highest theological education that could be given. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel in Acts 22, 3. Gamaliel in history, in Jewish history, is one of only seven rabbis to have ever received the recognition of the title Rabban. Gamaliel received that title. It's the equivalent to today what we would say a doctorate of law. However, the first time Paul is mentioned in the Bible, when we read it in Acts 7, 57 and 58, it is very clear that by 8, 1, Acts 8, 1, he has an infamous beginning. Paul consenting to Stephen's death. What an infamous beginning. What a terrible beginning. What a man who needed a new beginning. What a man who needed to leave his past behind. We know that this event created such a lasting impression on Saul because he made reference to it, and we read it, when he had the vision from Christ after his conversion in Acts 22:20, 20. The Lord when the blood of the, your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. If there was ever a person who needed to leave the past behind, it was Paul. So what about you today? I want you to know so many today blame so much on everyone else and sometimes even themselves. Everyone today is in the blame game. Everybody. It was my parents' fault, or it was the school's fault. It was my family's fault. You know they were never there. Or it was drugs' fault. Or it was alcohol's fault. It was the government's fault. Or it was credit card's fault. Listen. 
You never hear that from God's grace. Paul, as an overcomer, never speaks of anyone else saying it's their fault. He doesn't blame his past on anyone else. He simply lived for Jesus today, and he moved forward. He pressed forward. Not that he forgot. He didn't. He mentioned what a terrible person he was in Galatians 1.13, in 1 Corinthians 15.9, and in Philippians 3.6, because he knew how far the Lord Jesus had taken him. So I ask you this question now, after do you live for Jesus, here's the next one. Do you want to leave your past behind? Oh, church, I wrestled with that one question for 30 years. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to leave your past behind. It's a glorious thing when Jesus so not only radically saves you, but changes you from the inside out. That you don't blame anyone else, you don't blame yourself, you simply leave the past behind. It's a great thing to be spiritually mature enough in Christ Jesus to leave your past behind. And Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. The first thing you must do to leave your past behind is found in Acts chapter 9. Turn there. If you don't do these things, you cannot leave your past behind. It's not optional. You'll carry it with you all the time. It'll burden you continually. And so I want you to see very clearly how the Apostle Paul leaves his past behind in Acts chapter 9. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. By the way, I believe people that he beat and threw in prison died. Okay? I, I don't believe it was just Stephen. I think... Saul was responsible for the deaths of many. And he's breathing out. That he went to the high priest, verse 2, and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, I bet he was, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's always a good thing when you hear a voice from the Lord. What do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. I don't think that Saul is converted yet. Verse 7, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. That's always good when the Lord calls your name. Here I am. Verse 11, So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Now do you believe that the Lord is specific? I mean, I don't know how... Uh, he gives him the street address, folks, and tells him what house to go to. For behold, here it is, he is praying. Every person that's ever entered the kingdom of heaven has done so the same way. Rich or poor, educated or uneducated, a thousand years ago, if Jesus tarries, a hundred years from now. All people who ever go to heaven, whether they speak Russian or Chinese, whether they speak Spanish or Hebrew, no, it makes no difference. All people that ever go to heaven will pray. In verse 12, And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. 
Then Ananias answered, isn't it funny how the Lord always uses other people? You understand the Lord didn't need Ananias. To, the Lord always uses other people. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard much, heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Isn't it amazing how Saul's reputation precedes him? They know all about him already and what kind of man he is. Verse 15, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. I've always pictured big, heavy contacts. And he received his sight at once. And he arose and was baptized. Okay. Some of you are saying, what does that have to do with leaving my past behind? I want you to know, you cannot leave your past behind if you never have an experience with the Lord Jesus. So I ask you this way, have you ever had an experience with the living Lord Jesus? Have you ever had an experience with him? Can you tell me when you received Jesus as your Savior? I didn't ask, when were you baptized? I don't mean, when did you go through confirmation, which is usually 12 weeks. I'm asking, when was the day you were born again? Saul knew, and he never forgot. When did Jesus reach down and say to you, follow me? See, Jesus wants you to know that you are born again. He wants you to know that you are saved. For many people, the Lord was drawing them as small children. That's true of me. But that is not necessarily when you were saved. How do I know that? Because many people bear no fruit. I don't mean they don't bear fruit between 7 and 9. I mean they bear no fruit for 20 or 30 years, they bear no fruit. Just because a person makes a profession of faith as a child does not mean that they are saved. And I know this from my own personal experience. I went forward as a small child. I don't know how old I was. I was little. I don't know when I was baptized, but I know that I was. There's no memory of either of those events. But do I believe that the Lord Jesus was drawing me? Yes. The Lord Jesus draws children to himself. However, when I had an experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, on a Friday night of August of 1982, on the 38th verse of whatever hymn they were singing, I still remember what the pastor was saying as I was gripping the pew in front of me with all of my might, and the pastor said, if you say no to Jesus tonight, it will be easier the next time, and you will go through your life saying no to Jesus. And I knew in that moment I didn't want that to be me. So I went forward, and I received Christ as my Savior. So many people have had experiences as children, but they have never repented of sin. See, it's later when we understand what sin is, and we have to repent of our sin and truly be saved. And many stories are similar to my story. See, Paul thought he was saved. That's why he was so dangerous. He thought he knew the right way. He thought he knew what was best. But it wasn't until the Lord Jesus spoke to him that he knew he was lost. What about you? Has Jesus spoken to your heart? Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you've been converted? Have you been saved? 
Have you repented of sins? See, when Paul did, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he was able to leave the past behind and begin again. The second thing, if you want to leave the past behind, besides being converted, there's something else you have to do. If you want to truly leave the past behind, you need to know it's going to take others. If you truly want to be a new creature in Christ and experience His grace regularly, you need to know it will take others in your life. It will take others. No one can do it alone. No one. You can't and I can't. No one forget, can forget the past and be free in the present without the help of others. The Apostle Paul, it took more than one other. It took Ananias, but it also took Barnabas. Barnabas. He was the second person to encourage Saul and really pour into his life so that he could leave the past behind. Look, if you would, just two chapters later in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 24, and you'll see this. Acts 11, beginning in 24. It speaks of Barnabas, and it says this, For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Now, here, Luke uses just an instrument for us to realize something, and we do it still in English today. He transitions from the present tense to the past tense. And so, apparently, when, the, when Luke is writing here in Acts, Barnabas is already deceased. He's died. For he was a good man. When you speak in past tense of people, usually they're gone. I mean, that, that's how normal people do it. And Luke's writing that way. And so Barnabas has gone on to be with the Lord. And a great many people were added to the Lord, talking about Barnabas, because of his life. Then in verse 25, we see this. In Acts eleven twenty-five. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. I want you to know, if you're truly going to leave your past behind, other people are going to have to pour in your life, and you're going to have to do what they say. Saul is an independent man. And I want you to know, he does what Barnabas says. Barnabas says, you're coming with me. And Saul says, okay. Barnabas says to Saul, you're going to have to move cities. And Saul says, okay. And so he moves. He leaves his hometown, and he goes to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year, how long is Barnabas pouring into Saul's life? At least this year. But it's actually much longer. They assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. What a beautiful thing as we see Saul becoming Paul and leaving his past behind because other people are investing in his life. So here's the question for you. Who is pouring into your life? Who is helping you to leave the past behind? And then secondly, who are you encouraging to follow Jesus? Who is it that you're encouraging? If you want to leave the past behind, then you need to encourage Someone and someone needs to encourage you. You need to be encouraged, and then you have to encourage someone else. Third, if you want to leave the past behind, you must come to terms with who you are and what you've done. Paul did that. You must come to terms with who you are and what you've done. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Now, this makes everybody uncomfortable. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. It does. Nobody enjoys this process. But if you truly want to leave the past behind, you look forward to the goal and you'll learn how to do this. If you want to leave the past behind, it's going to take not only your conversion, experience with Jesus, it then takes others pouring into your life. And thirdly, you must come to terms with who you are and what you do. This is the common experience for everyone. Look at Romans 7, beginning in verse 18. Here it is. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. 
Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. When I first read that as a teenager, I thought, that's a cop-out. I mean, goodness, that's like multiple personality disorder right there. You know, I began to look at it psychologically. Verse 21, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God concerning, according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh my goodness. It's a common experience for everyone. It really is. It doesn't matter what country you're in in the whole world. This is true of all people. We try to do good, and then we fail. And we try not to do evil, and we fail. And the result is sin, which leads to guilt. There's two natures within the believer, not one. And they're constantly at war with each other. And it is the spiritual side and the fleshly side. And these two are at war. But I want you to know they have been for every overcomer. When we recognize our sinful behavior, we will experience guilt. Because here's the truth. Every person in the room, give me your eyes, look at me for just a second. Everybody here, we all have bad habits. Everybody does. You've got a bad habit. I've got a bad habit. Everybody's got a bad habit. Now, many people will feel trapped in their sin, and they just want to give up and say, oh, well, it's just the way I am. Oh, how many times I have heard that. It's just the way I am. It just makes me want to hit people. I'm, I'm sorry. I, that's where I don't have, it's just the way I, now that's the cop-out. That's the cop-out. It's just the way I am. Well, no, it's not. You're a year older now. You're going to change. Like it or not, your teeth will fall out. Your hair will fall out or turn silver like mine. Something's going to happen. It's not a, you listen, it's not just the way you are because it may be the way you were, but you're a day older today than you were yesterday. Everything changes. And some of it's good. We're glad that you put on new clothes today. We don't want you in the same clothes day after day, week after week. How disgusting a thought. Aren't you glad you changed? At least your clothes. Come on, you need to nod at this point. Yes, we're all glad that we can change. So everybody has bad habits. Some people have told me, I just can't stop cursing. This week I had an incredible experience as your pastor. It was a man came into my house. He sat at the end of the table, and he had let loose, I'm going to say, 36 expletives at least, at least. And then he looks at me and says, now what do you do? <laughs> I just loved it. I loved it. Because then he said, what do you do? <laughs> he was, his whole demeanor changed. He had been cursing so bad. Y'all know, you've worked with people like this. Some people have said, I just can't stop drinking. Can't stop drinking. You know what? Here's what I've discovered. Every alcoholic stops drinking. Maybe right before they die, but they're going to stop. So you can't, you can't use that as a cop-out. Whatever else it may, it may be. Some people, it's language, some people it's drinking, you just name it, whatever it is. Some people don't cuss until they're in the car and they're by themselves. And then every person in front of them is in the way. Every single person. I, I've ridden with that person before, and they forgot I was there. What would you say? <laughs> just to mess with them, I said, you know, that's my mother. Is that mean to do that? You know, I, I want you to know change is possible. Change is possible for everyone. Now, some people say we shouldn't feel guilty when we sin. But I want you to know this passage and many others show us the fact that we are guilty. All of us are guilty. See, the Holy Spirit points out our guilt so that we can change and repent. That's why the Holy Spirit's there. It's God's way to prompt us to take action. And you say, well, what's the action? The action is confession and repentance. 
You can never alleviate your own guilt. By the way, if you never feel guilty about anything, you need to know that's a psychological condition. Okay? So a person who says, I don't ever feel guilty. Okay, not only are you lost, that's, that's a given. You're definitely lost, but you're not far from prison. Okay? So when somebody says, I don't feel guilty about anything, and I've had several people tell me that through the years, and I not only knew they were lost, I knew a few of them should have been in prison. And so mm, I just had a bad memory. So when you know that, you've got to realize guilt can be from the Holy Spirit. And then we have to depend on God's mercy through re confession and repentance. So God promises to bring change in our life. The Lord Jesus, he will bring change in our life when we trust him. But I want you to know, without a relationship with the Lord Jesus, you will never be able to change. In Romans 8, 1, we see the fulfillment of where guilt should go. How the Lord handles guilt in our lives and what he wants us to do with it after confession and repentance. Look at what Romans 8, 1 says. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So that's the end result of us living for Jesus. That the guilt is replaced, there's no condemnation because of confession and repentance. Jesus declares us innocent rather than guilty. Dealing with guilt feelings, by the way, can be a daily battle. And I want you to know it is best fought with spiritual truth. How do you deal with the daily battle of guilt? You confess, you repent, and you quote Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Another way you deal with it is by the renewing of your mind. Paul talks about that in Romans 12, 1. Renew your mind. How do you do that? You do it through the Word of God, by reading His Word. You do it through corporate worship and singing. You do it through the fellowship of other believers. Remember, it always will take someone else in your life for you to change. We learn to refuse the lies that Satan tells us through our own thoughts or the words of others that continually tell us that we're guilty. When Satan reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Always remember that, that there's a lake of fire waiting for him. So when you have not met your own expectations or the expectations of others, you have to remember, lastly, what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When you're still dealing with guilt from the past, and the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Wherever you find yourself today, regardless of what your past is, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus and you're attempting to renew your mind and you're having others pour into your life, you need to know the Lord's grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. One of the most powerful programs that you will ever see is cardboard testimonies. Cardboard testimonies. Usually one word of what you were, and then you flip it to one word of what you are. You were lost, and then you flip it and you're saved. You were abused, but then now, today, you have peace. You were divorced, but today, you're secure, happy, and know that the Lord loves you. You were, and now you are. What Christ has made in you. See, Christ in you the hope of glory.
My grace is sufficient for you. Life presents all kinds of troubles. But those who belong to Jesus Christ have an abundance of grace. Unlimited, unbounded favor in God. I want you to know that allows us to deal with our past and put it behind us. We may sometimes be disappointed in how far short we fall, but I want you to know God has already deposited into your account and mine His abundant grace so that you don't have to play the blame game anymore and you don't even have to blame yourself. His righteousness deposited into our accounts to reign and to rule in this life means that no situation, including death, can ultimately defeat us as his sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Today, if you want to leave your past behind, I want you to know you can do it, but you can't do it alone. Some of you today need to come and simply pray at this altar, but then you need to walk out there and tell someone to pray with you. You go to the Welcome Center. Some of you need to go to the Welcome Center and you have, need to have someone pray with you and you need to receive Christ as your Savior. Others of you need to join this church and receive baptism. Just walk out to the Welcome Center and someone will pray with you and greet you. If you need to rededicate your heart and life to the Lord today because you've wandered far away, today I want you to know because of the grace of God and other people helping you, you can leave your past behind and do business with Jesus today. Let's all stand. Lord Jesus, we're th so thankful that you don't condemn us. Paul had a terrible past, and he was able to leave it behind because of the abundant grace of God, because of the help of others, and Lord, because of his incredible conversion where he knew that you were real. Lord, I pray that everyone here would know that you're real and they would have an experience with you. I pray that everyone here, Lord, would have the help of others pouring into their life knowing that Jesus Christ loves them and will never give up on them. I pray that everyone here, Lord, would know that the grace of God is sufficient for them because in our weakness you are made strong Lord Jesus have your way with us now as we in every way surrender afresh and anew to you in Jesus name we pray Amen